Next up, animal virus replication. Under this topic, we're going to be talking about attachment, entry and uncoding, synthesis, assembly and release, and latency. Because animal cells do not have a cell wall, animal viruses have a variety of ways that they can enter into the cell. First, let's talk about direct penetration. This is just like bacterial phages. They attach to the receptors on the cytoplasmic membrane and the viral genome is injected into the cell, the capsid is left on the outside. An example of a virus that does this is poliovirus. Some enveloped viruses undergo membrane fusion, which means that their envelope fuses with the cellular membrane. So the viral glycoproteins attach to the receptors in the cytoplasmic membrane of the host, then this process of attaching also leads to fusion of the envelope. The glycoproteins are left on the cytoplasmic membrane and the capsid enters the cell. Now because we've got this protein coat, we've got to get the genome out. So we call this uncoating. The capsid is broken down, the viral genome is released into the cytoplasm, and it goes on to synthesis. I do want to point out that this method of attachment, entry, and encoding is not something that happens with non-enveloped viruses. This only happens with envelope viruses. Now an example of a virus that does this sort of attachment, entry, and encoding would be HIV. Some viruses, both enveloped and non-enveloped, trick the cell into endocytosing it. So it attaches to the receptors on the cell, the cell endocytoses it, goes into a phagocytic um, phagosome. Most of the time before a lysosome can fuse with the phagosome and destroy the virus inside, the virus causes either fusion of its envelope with the phagosome and it's popped out, or it causes lysis of the phagosome. In any case, you have the capsid with the genome in the cytoplasm, and we have to undergo encoding because we can't transcribe the, genet uh, the genes on the viral genome if it's all covered up with protein. An example of an enveloped virus that would go undergo this type of attachment entry and encoding would be influenza virus. An example of a non-enveloped virus would be adenovirus. Now let's go on to synthesis. The genome is now in the cell and it's going to proceed to make more of all of its parts. Let's start with double-stranded DNA. Double-stranded DNA, after it enters the cell, goes to the nucleus. Now double-stranded DNA looks the same as the cell's DNA, so it's treated the same way. So mRNAs go into the cytoplasm after they're transcribed in the nucleus. The proteins are produced in the cytoplasm off of the ribosomes and the genome remains in the nucleus. Now single-stranded DNA also gets moved to the nucleus, but it is different from the cell. So it has to bring, the virus has to bring its own enzymes to convert the single-stranded DNA to double-stranded DNA because animal cells don't have that enzyme. Then from there, the double-stranded DNA is treated the same as if it had started out as double-stranded DNA with doing all of this fun stuff. So it gets treated the same as the cellular DNA. On to the RNAs. Let's start with the single-stranded RNA. Now the single-stranded RNA stays in the cytoplasm because in eukaryotic cells that's where most of the RNA goes. That's, uh, there's two different kinds. There's the positive sense or the positive sense single-stranded RNA and there's the negative sense single-stranded RNA. Let's follow the positive sense first. Positive sense single-stranded RNA can act as an mRNA. So ribosomes clamp immediately on it, start making viral proteins. Now one of the viral proteins that are encoded in the genome of the positive sense, single-stranded RNA, 
is an enzyme that can take this positive sense RNA and make a negative sense RNA out of it, complementary copies, and then it makes more copies to make positive sense single-stranded RNA that gets packaged into the capsid. Now, negative sense RNA cannot act as an mRNA. We need to make a complementary copy that can act as an mRNA. Once again, cells do not have enzymes to make RNA copies from RNA. It just doesn't do it. But because this has to happen before any viral proteins can be made, the virus has to bring in the capsid, the enzyme, to do this. Then from the complementary copies, they act like mRNAs, and they also act like a template for the new negative sense genome. Okay, last one, double-stranded RNA. That also stays in the cytoplasm, but eukaryotic cells don't know how to handle double-stranded RNA. So the virus has to bring enzymes for making a copy off of the template strand. We make a positive strand, so the double-stranded RNA acts like double-stranded DNA. But it's all happening in the cytoplasm, makes a positive sense single strand that proceeds to act like an mRNA. From there, we can make everything that the virus needs. And the genome is duplicated like double-stranded DNA, but you've got to have enzymes that can attach to double-stranded RNA to be able to do that. So those are part of the enzymes that are coded for in the genome of the virus. Now I know all of this is quite confusing because with the exception of this one and part of the positive sense, cells don't do this. This is completely new. And let me tell you, it was confusing to the researchers when they were first looking into this. But if you go over this multiple times, hopefully you'll become more familiar with it. Now that we've synthesized all of the parts of the virus, then we need to figure out how to put everything together and get out. So the virus assembles, the genome is put in the capsid, any enzymes that are associated are either packaged inside or become associated with the envelope. So let's follow the enveloped virus path because that's what we've got a diagram for. And viral glycoproteins, or receptors, are embedded in the membrane. That acts as an attachment site for the virus and any enzymes that it may be carrying in between the envelope and the capsid. Then, as it does this, the virus buds out. It kind of looks like budding in a little yeast cell. It buds out, and the mature enveloped virion goes on to infect another cell. If it is a naked virus, for one, the viral glycoproteins are going to be a part of the capsid. And there's two ways for a non-enveloped virus to get out of an animal cell. First one, it can just lyse the cell. Just like bacterial phages lysing the bacterial virus. But some trick the cell into exocytosing them as if they were a hormone or some other product that it was exporting to out of the cell. So it would incorporate it into a vesicle, it would carry it to the outside, and it would exocytose it and pop the unenveloped viral capsid out into the environment where it can go infect another cell. Now, in animals, you often have an immune response to this replication cycle you feel sick, or the virus causes damage, once again causing disease. But there are some viruses, specifically the retrovirus and the herpes virus families, which undergo latency. That's where you have the virus inside of the host cell not causing any symptoms. So with the retrovirus, it's like the lysogenic replication cycle of a bacterial phage. An example of the retrovirus family would be HIV, of which we have a diagram here. The RNA genome goes into the cell, we make a double-stranded DNA copy from it, and it's inserted into the host genome. 
but instead of calling it a prophage, we call it a provirus because animal viruses are called viruses and bacterial viruses are called phages. There it can hang out without replicating any proteins, without causing any viruses, and this is called latency. It's inside the cell. If the cell uh, divides, then a copy of that provirus is made. Now, the difference between a retrovirus, provirus, and a prophage is that we can't get that genome out of the cell genome. Wish we knew how. It'd be, it would be wonderful. But once it's incorporated, we can't get it out. And the genome will come out of latency and make viral particles that are budded continually out of that infected cell. Yay. Herpes virus, on the other hand, if you've ever had a cold sore or if you've had chicken pox, those viruses are in latency inside of your cells. Now instead of incorporating into your genome, they form little circles of double-stranded DNA in your nucleus and they just kind of hang out. When you're not having shingles, which is reactivation of chickenpox, or if you're not having an outbreak of a cold sore, then they're just kind of hanging out. They can be activated and they can make more of themselves and butt out of the cell, infecting other cells, you get an immune response, you get a lesion, and that's how herpes virus cycles between the active replication phase and the latency phase. Now, I should mention that with herpes virus, they undergo latency in nerve, at least for herpes simplex and for varicella zoster, the chicken pox and shingles virus, but when they're actually um, actively replicating, they're doing that in the mucosa or the skin. So they travel up the nerve virus to hang out in latency, and when they're activated, the DNA travels down the nerve fiber and actively divides in the skin or mucosa that is at the end of that nerve. It would be nice to know how to get rid of those little circles of DNA during latency. We haven't figured out how to do that either. That's it for this topic. Here are some reminders of what you need to learn from this topic.